Our learning tonight is dedicated in honor of selfless medical professionals, doctors, nurses, PAs, lab technicians, hospital cleaning staff, Hatsala EMTs, first aiders, and all those who are truly so selflessly at this time. And our learning, and may our learning merit for Stanley Chira and all of those who have fallen ill at this time. Um, welcome to everybody. I hope everybody is feeling good and feeling healthy. Um, and although we're dedicating time to learning, I'm hoping that you're all keeping sane by, and, and although we're devoting this hour to learning, and I'm gonna bring us, I'm gonna talk a lot about the, the crisis that we're in the middle of, I hope that you're finding plenty of time to distract yourselves, as I am, with good TV, good books, uh, schmoozing with long lost friends, especially people who you may have lost touch with, and especially people who really need us to reach out to them at this time. So, it, it seems impossible, but our worlds have become teenier and teenier and teenier over the last few weeks. And at the same time, our world has actually become bigger than we could have ever imagined. In the face of the virus, we are desperately and literally creating tiny bubbles around ourselves, reducing our human contact, sometimes even to zero. And yet the same virus is connecting us to the most essential part of our humanity. The most essential part of our identity actually, our humanity in the most bubble busting manner. We have a deeply wired impulse to create national, religious, ethnic identities, which help us thrive and survive. Even in the face of our deepest fears, when my husband had cancer, we were supported by the idea of a cancer community, which understood us in ways that nobody else could. But this is different. The club is the entire world. Now the entire world is the COVID-19 community. From within our tiny bubbles, we identify with the fear and suffering of people, even in the most remote corners of the world, in ways that we're not accustomed. We are dependent on our anonymous neighbors, our local communities, and even people on the other side of our planet to survive. And they are dependent on us. We are each and every one of us responsible for the health of our own families and also for the health of families whom we don't know and we may never know. Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelaze has become writ very, very large. I'm struggling to find the right language even to describe it. It's not the first time in human history that this is true. In fact, it is always true in ways that we just don't think about that we're all responsible, that all of humanity is responsible for each other. But it is acutely and explicitly true in this moment. Typically, when I receive email requests to say to Helim, I see it as a push to make myself more empathetic. Now when I receive to Helim notices, I feel immediate and intense empathy, almost to tears, because the illness is as close to me as it is to the people for whom I'm praying. And when I read about people in Borough Park or Italy or Africa or Jerusalem, I feel the same empathy. I am in a tiny bubble, but my world has become enormous. The idea that we can at once live in a small community and at the same time feel ourselves to be part of a larger reality of humanity is actually essential to Judaism. If you look for these experiences, which we can label particularist and universalist, you will find them throughout our Torah literature and in particular in our Siddur, in our prayers. And they coexist, the universal and the particular, 
and are powerfully expressed over Pesach. In my family, we have an unusual text that reminds us at our seders that our most national moment of celebration is also a deeply universal moment. The text was introduced to us by my son-in-law, Micah, while he was still dating our daughter and while he was at YU taking a course in American literature. The readings are from a narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. While reading the narratives for class, he heard echoes of the Pesukim from Devarim, which we read in the Haggadah. He created a document which pairs the Pesukim about Abdut Mitzrayim with, the pass with passages from the slave narratives. Here's an example, and I, I can give, should I give, should I give a try to screen share now? So you can see these? Let me give it one quick try. Um, <laughs> Should be on the bottom bar, you see a green arrow? So I have the share, but when I go into my Safari, I'm looking, okay, I'm not gonna try, I'm not gonna waste too much time on this, but I think it's worth seeing it for a minute. Um, I'm trying to find it. I have a tab on my, Vivian, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So are you t I, I have a tab on, you know, I, I, I should have a tab on my screen if I can. Um, uh, maybe I can do it this way. <laughs> that wasn't a good move. Um, <laughs> Vivian? Yeah, so you have your text open? I have my text open. We have to go back to the Zoom. That's what I'm having trouble with. Um, it might be in a little box on your screen. Like you might see a person. Do you see? I know what the Zoom thing, the Zoom. Okay, maybe it. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everybody. This is not working. I've done this before, but I'm not. Um, Natalie, screen, uh, screen, sh share Emily. screen. Emily. Uh, Emily, share screen in the bottom. I, I know I did that. Okay, hold on. Uh, let me, I think this, all right. All right, let's, we're not going to share it. It's for some reason, I've done this and it's just not working. I'm going to read to you and if you'd like, send me um, use the chat to send me your emails and maybe I'll send them out to you. Um, so, paired with Bayitnu Aleinu Avoda Kasha. We read this every year in our, in our seders. The words have become ritualized for us. And language being fluid, thankfully for us, Avoda, even Kasha, can mean avodat bayit, homework, it can be housework, it can be professional work, or even remarkably, avodat Hashem. In the slave, in the slave narratives, the term avodat kasha comes to life in a different way. And here is, here is Frederick Douglass. It was never too hot or too cold. It could never rain, blow hail or snow too hard for us to work in the field. Work, work, work was scarcely more the order of the day than of the night. A few months of the discipline tamed me. Mr. Covey, my master, succeeded in breaking me. I was broken in body, soul, and spirit. The dark night of slavery closed in upon me. And behold, a man turned into a brute. Tanakh is typically sparse on the details. Its goal is to teach religious values and to celebrate the story of our miraculous national redemption from Egypt. But in our Tanakh, sparse language is designed to spark imagination. We are commanded and expected to imagine into the words of Tanakh that are in our Haggadah, the emotions of our forefathers in order to internalize these values. The mitzvah of Magid, of telling the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim 
is a mitzvah of imagination and of language, very importantly. But it's hard for us to find the language. And therein lies the famous command at the Seder, admonition at the Seder, kol hamarbeli l'saper b'itziyat mitzrayim harei zemeshubach. We're supposed to expand our language. We're supposed to draw on as much language as we can to tell the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim. Frederick Douglass's diary is expansive and personal and emotional. It has the potential to illuminate for us the experience of our ancestors in words that feel awkward on one hand because they're mid 19th century American, African American slaves. But on the other hand, they feel quite familiar. Here's another example. Vanizak el Hashem Voltenu. Douglas describes the prayers that he heard the older slaves on the plantation singing. They breathe the prayer and complaint of souls boiling over with the bitterest anguish. Every tone was a testimony against slavery and a prayer to God for deliverance. To those songs, I trace my first glimmering conception of the dehumanizing nature of slavery. At our Seder, we are commanded to remember, even to reenact the anguished prayers of our fathers, to identify with their za'akot, their cries, and to empathize across a thousand generations with their bitterness and tears and fears. And just as Douglas traces his recognition of the evils of slavery to the prayers he heard, we too are commanded to recognize its evil in the suffering of our fathers and fiercely reject slavery and the, the slavery and oppression that they experienced forever. The pairings of the two texts of the Haggadah and the slave narratives work in two directions. The first we've discussed, the slave narratives help us imagine our slavery story more vividly, making our own Seder experience more profound. The diary of an American slave in the mid 19th century can illuminate and make and deepen the reality of slavery for us in the 21st century. But in the other direction, there's an additional impact. When we read the American slaves narratives alongside our own Haggadah, alongside our own national Jewish narrative, we are reminded that we are not alone in this experience. That there have, there's a long history of slavery, right? Before Mitzray, Ara Yitziat Mitzrayim, and sadly and almost incomprehensibly for thousands of years later and still today. It pushes us to imagine and understand more deeply the African-American slave experience with compassion and connection. Both results are explicitly mandated in the Torah. The mitzvah of Magid, the Higadet Televincha by Yom HaHum Lemor, and the rituals of the Seder are designed to reenact the slavery and the redemption, telling stories about our own answers as if we were li are living through them is an act of moral imagination and empathy. But we are also commanded to use the story of our slavery to activate compassion for others who have gone through and are going through oppression themselves. Where do we see that? Where do we know, how do we know that, that we're supposed to use, someone can raise their hands and tell me that? Where in Torah, where does Torah tell us that we should use our experience in Mitzrayim to activate compassion? Where is that in the Torah? Here's a hint, and I'm sure you've all heard this. Shabbat, maybe? 36, what? Who's Shabbat, that? unless I'm mistaken. Shabbat does, that is a great, who's, but who said this? Madeline. Hi, Madeline. So Shabbat does, in a way, that is a good point. Shabbat, Shabbat um, commemorates two historical events. On one hand, you'd say, you'd say um, the creation of the world, which is why we, quote unquote, rest on Shabbat, but also you're 100% right. And we see this in, in the second version of Aseret Hadibrot, 
Joey, did you want to say something? Well, yeah. when, they, when they discuss the gab. Well, so hold the on, Matthew, one minute. Let me just stay with Madeline's Shabbat. Okay. But it's, um, um, we, remet, we said we'd have Shabbat because we evoke Yitziat Mitzrayim, and therefore, how does the rest of it go? We don't say this in Kiddush. And therefore, who else has to rest on Shabbat? Slaves, um, animals, slaves, everyone. Slaves, yeah. Our servants, our slaves, our animals, and so forth. Our Absolutely. Animals. I think that's a good reference. Joe, what were you going to say? <laughs> agreed, agreed, agreed. Oh, but why agreed. else? Where else do we have? Where when they discuss the gear. When they discuss the uh, gear. Right. Uh, the gear. 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 The The Torah ta uses that language. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and use that experience to shape your moral lives. Use that experience every time you encounter a stranger, a person who is weak, a person who needs support. That is the foundation of our lives as Jews. Um, this year, so we have these two, so the slave narrative. And I wish you could see them. I, I, I don't know that we're going to have time to read. There were two other selections that I, I considered reading. Maybe I'll get to them in a little bit while that are actually astounding in their, you know, connection to each other. But this, so this year, bringing it to our, our, our contemporary time and to the reality in which we find ourselves now, maybe uniquely this year. The suffering around us transcends religion and nationality and even geography. In unprecedented ways, we are acutely dependent on a sense of interconnectedness in order to survive. So as we care for our families and communities, we must also activate the compassionate imagination that Pesach, Pesach and the Seders ask us for. For a long while, we're going to be sharing anxieties, fears, pain, and even, God forbid, loss with the whole of humankind. That's a daunting thought. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of overwhelming to think of, but, and there'll be much to learn from that. We may, we are already, are interconnected, through our interconnectedness, we're sharing medical data, we're sharing medical strategies, we may find comfortness in our commonality, comfort in our commonalities. We may learn coping skills for each other. But I think it'll be a new way for many of us to see the world in which we live as Jews. And now, any questions first? Before I, I want to bring you to another text that's a little bit more personal and I think even maybe more comforting. Questions, comments? Okay. So for the second text, the second text that I want to bring you to, uh, let me, I'll, I'll introduce it like this. Um, the other day I read a beautiful article by Erica Brown. Who knows Erica Brown? Hands? Erica Brown is a writer. Hi, so she, Michelle, hi. <laughs> Sarah, so some, the reason I think some of you might know her not only from her writings is that Erica Brown grew up in Deal, New Jersey. Um, she's, um, and she has a beautiful article relating in, in the Lair House this week the, for Parshat Vayikra, which relates to COVID and how we experience it. It resonated with me and For me, I springboarded off it to another text that I think, um, I think can be comforting. The title of her article is, Who Knows? So how do we say who knows in Hebrew? Mi yodea. Right? And clearly that's a Pesach phrase, right? But from where? Because Syrians aren't, from where is, where is, why is that a Pesach phrase? From the song, Echad Mi Yodea. Echad, right, from the song, right? It's hardly a core, essential 
part of foundational part of the Haggadah, but I think this year I will definitely sing it differently and it'll move towards the center of the Haggadah for me. So Erica talks about, so who knows, right? That's, that's a powerful question nowadays, right? And Erica talks about the anxiety of not knowing, right? And I was thinking, in fact, that the anxiety of not knowing our future, of not understanding our present and not knowing our future, is actually possibly a feature of the experience of slavery. In other words, slaves who have no control over their destiny on the most hour to hour, daily basis, weekly basis, they also, they have no idea what's happening to them. They have no idea what comes next for them, what kind of work they're gonna be doing next, how they're going to be treated next. If, and this is the most profound experience of slavery, if tomorrow they will be sold to another owner, separated from their families. So the anxiety of not knowing, the anxiety of, of, of the unknowable is very deeply rooted in slavery. And for us nowadays, that's a very intense and frightening part of our realities. Who knows how the virus really works? Who really understands what the after effects are? of the virus and on our society. Even doctors don't know, and certainly the information coming up at us is so confusing. Who knows what the real incubation time is? Who knows when we are really cured or no longer contagious? Who knows when school will open? Who knows where the malls will open? Who knows when we'll go back to normal? So Erica goes through Tanakh and she she found echoes of this, actually explicit echoes of this, in more places in Tanakh than we might have expected. Who knows? Is a big, turns out to be a recurring theme in Tanakh. Anybody have some ideas? Miodea, where is it in Tanakh? Some of the places are very familiar to you. You've read them many times. Some of them not. One big line is there. Excellent. There. Excellent. Where that's going to be the most, I, to me, that was the most powerful one in relation to this. We're going to get that. Who uses that phrase in Megillah there? And when? Mordechai. Mordechai. Mordechai, right? He says, to, when he comes to Esther, and he says, Mi odea im ka'et hazot higat lamachut. Who knows? Maybe it's for this moment that you have arrived at, at Mahut. Where else? Let me ask you, what? Kohelet. Excellent, Sarah. So I was going to ask you, where in Tanakh do we have the most open-ended, existential, who knows anything? And Sarah's right, that would be Kohelet, right? Kohelet is a reflection on just the most existential, impossibility of knowing anything in Tanakh and what do we do with that. And Kohelet actually offers us very little comfort and, and no answers to that. Reading Kohelet at this moment, if anything, just reminds us that sometimes life is unknowable, that sometimes the unknowing, the lack of knowledge, the confusion of not knowing what comes next is part of everybody's life. And the other ones, there's a text that we read on Yom Kippur. I was thinking of Joseph. But Where that... would be in Joseph? I'm th I, maybe I missed that one. Who's speaking? Freda. Oh, hi, Freda. <laughs> Joseph. I'm, I can't think of where it would be in Joseph. It Joseph, could... when, his, when he says, who knows? Didn't he say, who knows why? I was thrown ah, into the pit. You know, when, he re, re, when he reconciles, hi Franny, one second. When he reconciles with his brothers, that is a very good point, right? Who knows if that is why, um, I don't know if he evokes God in that moment, but he's basically saying, who knows if that is why 
you all, and I ended up in Egypt able to help, you know, my, my family. That's a very good point. Yona. Yona, who's saying that? Henriette. Wait. Sorry, I'm not on video. It's okay, it's okay. I just, <laughs> so Yona is a very important one. So we have Yosef. Who says it in, in the book of Yona? There's only four chapters there. And only three of them the have king? the king, exactly. But, but Henriette, you, it's so interesting that you immediately thought of Yona. Fran Burley. Fran, unmute yourself. Fran? It's Carol. I'm on her. Oh, Carol. Okay. <laughs> Carol, I'm so happy to see you. A little disappointed that it's not Franny. Okay. Carol, do you want to say something? No, no. I was just letting you know it wasn't Fran. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, this is Mabatan. Yes. What about Abraham and Yitzhak at the Akeda also read about on Rosh Hashanah? Abraham does it. Yitzhak says, who's going to, what's going to happen with the sacrifice? So Abraham asks the question, that's a hard one, because Yitzhak asks the question, oh, that's such a hard moment, because Abraham does know. Abraham knows, but he really doesn't know, right? <laughs> that's a very hard one. Let, let's, I think once we talk a little more, maybe the Akedah, who know, the, the knowing or the not knowing in the Akeda, I, I don't know what to do with it yet. <laughs> but maybe when we talk about the other examples that are a little bit more straightforward, that something might come to light around the Akeda. So for now we have Yosef, we have Yonah, the king of Nineveh, the non-Jewish king of Assyria, Nineveh, in the book of Yonah, and we had Kohelet and also Esther. So let, let's just start with those. Um, so Kohelet is, is very, um, it's a painful <laughs> um, pasuk in Kohelet. It's Kohelet Perek Vav Pasuk Yudbet. Who even knows what is good for a man in his life? The counting of the days of his life are like a breath. And who will even tell man, man what will happen? Who will be, what will happen after him? under the sun. So this is very like almost hopeless expression of who knows. Yona, the king of Nineveh, is actually not hopeless. He says Yona, who's he says who knows in actually a very hopeful way. Because isn't that correct? Sometimes you can say who knows and it can lead to paralysis. Who the hell knows what it's all about and why care about anything? But all the other times in Tanakh actually are hopeful and lead to action. In Yonah, the king of, Yo the king of Nineveh, after Yonah has walked through the city proclaiming in five short words um, that they need to do Teshuvah, the king responds immediately. He gives an order to the people to um, perform rituals of teshuvah, but more important, and you must all turn away from the evil that you have done. Mi yodea, who knows? Yashuv v'nicham ha'elokim v'shav mecharon ha'po v'lo noved. Who knows, he says. I don't know for sure. I don't know if all of our teshuvah will work, but we must do something. We must take action, right? And we have hope. I don't know how God runs his world, and Yosef echoes that certainly. There's something 
in Yosef's words too, he says, unlike, by the way, unlike some of the things I'm hearing about, you know, our situation now where people seem to be, have knowledge about what God, God's intentions are, but Yosef very clearly says, I don't know if I was sent here, if all of the things, these things happened just to position me in order to be able to help my brethren, but here I am. I don't know what God had in mind, but I do know what I have to do, Yosef seems to be doing. I know what we have to be doing as a family, and this is how we're going to act. And the king of Ninveh too, Mi Odea, he says, I don't know, but I have hope. And based on that hope, not on that surety, based on that hope, in the face of confusion, in the face of the anxiety of no knowledge and possible destruction in the case of Ninveh, he, he says, Mi Odea, maybe God, I can't, there's no magic here. There's no automatic consequence when it comes to anything, but mi odea, maybe God, if we turn, maybe God too will turn. And niham, regret, or reset the plan, you know, what, what, what the plan was to punish us. And in Esther, I think it's really the most powerful in that extraordinarily pivotal moment in chapter four in Esther. Esther has been actually paralyzed. All the Jews in Shushan are terrified and she is terrified as well. And she seems to be paralyzed. She's terrified. The one thing she knows for sure is that people who go before the king without being summoned are killed, right? And she learned that very clearly from Vashti, right? So she knows that she knows for certain what there is to be terrified about. In response, Mordechai says, If you are quiet at this moment, if you are paralyzed by fear at this moment, but you, two words of possibility. Who knows? And those two words, it's so amazing. Those two words of uncertainty, right, spur her to action. And the whole story of Purim turns on those two words, which I think most of us never pay attention to. So in our Haggadah, this leads me to, and I, I had it up on my, I thought I could have it up on my screen to you, screens for you, that famous Echad Mi Yodea song, which just feels differently, different to me now. Because whereas historically, it's always been just kind of a fun, kind of trivia, Jewish trivia, who knows one, I know one, who knows 13, who knows 12, and so on. Now, in light of these miodeas throughout Tanakh, and I credit Erica with giving me this perspective, Echad Miodea seems to be a series of questions, almost, they could be anxious questions. Who knows? We don't know any, we, there's so much we don't know, but for each one of them, there's an answer. For each one of them, we say to ourselves, well, we don't know. I don't know how long this coronavirus is going to last and what exactly is going to happen, but there are certain things that I do know with certainty. And this year, I'm going to read Echad Mi Yodea. I'm going to sing it in that light. There's so much that we don't know, but we need to celebrate what we do know. So for instance, and you can help me with this because I, I don't have it up on the board, but Echad mi yodea, Echad ani yodea, Echad elokeinu asher bashamayimu ba'aretz. One thing I know, I have a relationship with 
Borei Olam, the creator of the universe and of all of mankind. And that has to comfort me. We have a covenant with God. We have a mission in the world. Shlosha and Arba'a, our mothers and our fathers. We have historic forefathers, ancestors, and we also have our own mothers and fathers. Even those of us who no longer have fathers and mothers, we have family. We have family history. We have comfort in our continuity. Um, I, I can't remember all of them. Five, Hamisha Ani Odea, Hamisha Chum Shei Torah, and Shisha Sidrei Mishna. We have our Torah, which can guide us through this time and which guide our lives um, through all times. Shiv Ayim Mei Shabbata, even though I'm sure many of us have had the experience of losing sense of time and having no idea what day it is, we have seven days of the week. We have rhythms to our life still. And thankfully we have Shabbat, which really sets a rhythm for our life. Eight, what was eight? Shmona yimei mila and tisha yarchei leida. Brit Mila and nine months of pregnancy, we will still have life. We will still have children. We had our mothers and our fathers, our ancestors, and there's a future. We, were, we are still having children. And in my family alone, we had two baby boys born this past week. Um, what? <laughs> um, and so, I'm sorry? Seven is also Yemechupa. Excellent, yes. Wait, which is Yemechupa? Seven, Shiva. Seven. You're right. You may, is that in, in another version? This is how we sing it. Oh, really? Okay. I, in the Ashkenazic version, it's Shiva Yimei Shabbata. Um, okay. So, and so on and so forth. What? And that's what it is in the Sam Canton one. Which also. one? Shiva Yimei Shabbata. Okay. So, let me say this. Okay. So, let me say this. Okay. So, let me say this. I don't think any of us have to be rigidly bound to any text of Echad Miodea. And you can make up your own. I think it's worth, and we can go on and on, but I want, I want to wind down now. I think Echad Miodea can be for us all now, in the face of uncertainty, in the face of confusion, in the face of real, and I would never diminish this, because there's a point every day that I feel this deep, deep, deep anxiety of is the world ever going to be the same? And what is the world in so many ways and on so many levels, what is it going to look like when we come out of this? But I think when we sing Echad Mi Yodea, we should list the things that we do know. We should list the things that we, should, that we can make sure are certain and are stable and good in our lives, right? And I'm hopeful that that will you know, give all of us a certain amount of comfort and celebration in, in the weeks to come. Any questions? <laughs> I don't know how far we've gone. I think we're good. They told me it was half an hour, but I could stretch to a little longer. So how is everybody doing? So everybody's giving me mazal tov, so just let me explain to you. It's <laughs> my daughter Devorah's sister-in-law. It's not, no, my, I don't have a new grandchild. My daughter has, a new niece and somebody else also. <laughs> Another very close connection. Um, um, but tell me something, how are you all doing? <laughs> Thank God. Let me hear your voices. Where are you, Morris? I'm in Manhattan with Glenda. Michelle and Adina, we have Michelle and Adina who are in Israel now. Uh, they're on. Oh, what? Wow. Yeah. Hi, Hi, Adina. It's so nice to see you. Like this. I love it. <laughs> All four of us are together. Wow. Wait, who else? Well, we have a few shamas. Okay. Yep. Can I ask a question? One question? 
Any, many questions. Who is, who um, is speaking now? This is Henrietta again, sorry. Um, I came into your class late, but I'm glad you extended it. Um, I, I was wondering when you were talking about all the situations where neo Dea is asked from our end to God, but what about the Ayeka and the Ayo of like God to us? Yeah, I love those. That's, where are you though? And right, I, but, but maybe it's a, maybe it's like a dialogue. Maybe it's like, Maybe it's like, it's not just like we wonder, but God asking us. Well, maybe we it's God, maybe really, when we say mi odea, what is, who knows what God is thinking or what God is doing, maybe God is turning to us and saying, where are you? Right, and exactly. Are you? Yes. I think what it means when right. God says, Ayeka, where are you and what are you doing? Right, exactly. So it's, it's not so. What? Right, right. So meaning that we that that that's also what God is asking from us. That's what I think. Yes, also, yeah. no, I like that. I love yeah. that you brought. That, I love that yeah. one. You brought that up, and it almost makes me feel as if whenever I hear Ayeka in Tanakh, I hear like this a bit of anxiety on God's part. Right. Where are we? Right. Where Where are you? I need right. you. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And by the way, there's one time in Tanakh where, no, it's different. <laughs> well, usually it's, it's related, it's a little bit not, but when, when Hashem says Ayeka, uh -huh. right? What is it's the rhetorical? Um, it's rhetorical, but who responds sometimes? How, what is the response? Hineni, right? Right, oh yeah, right. Like here I am, we're ready. We're ready to, to, right. to do it. But yeah. you know, there's a time in Tanakh where God says Hineni, or at least Ishayahu has God saying Hineni to us. Right. But he says it's at the time when we, um, it's actually in the Haftarah for Yom Kippur, and he says, the people, it's, it's funny, it's echoes of what you're saying. Ishayahu says, you ask where God is on Yom Kippur. You say, where is God? Why isn't he helping us? Why isn't he respond to our prayers? And Ishayahu says, God will respond to your prayers when you feed the poor and help the, the, the and, and clothe the, the naked and bring the hungry into your home. As Atatikra, you will call out and then Hashem will say, Hineni. Right. So I think all these, you're right, there are these dialogues of uncertainty between God and man that are, that Tanakh gives language to. Right. It's a very important, um, it's a very important, let's call it maybe a theological experience in Tanakh. Right. That maybe we don't think about enough. I'm Thank glad you. you brought that up. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Anyway, I, I'm not sure when they're going to shut me down here, or is anybody, Vivian? <laughs> I'd love to hear more from you. Is everybody- hey, Emily. not shutting you down, don't worry. <laughs> is everybody, Eli? I uploaded to the chat uh, a document you sent last year on Frederick Douglass. Oh, okay. The, is that-, that Is that- That's is that it, new? I sent, oh, okay. I'm so happy I sent it to you. So now, if you want, you can, can you hold on to that? If you can the chat. You could probably download it from the chat if, if, if you just whoever, go in there. I don't know, whoever wants to download it, I don't know. That's, it's a nice uh, a document and I got permission from my son-in-law to share it. It was a very nice way for him to come into our family. Because, I mean, I can say this also, when he sent it to us, I think he was a little nervous. There was an email where he said, I don't know, is, you know, he was a little worried whether his maybe Maybe future father-in-law was going to like it, but as you can imagine, you can imagine that it was the kind of thing my husband really, really loved, and we've really incorporated into our in, into our seder. Question? What? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm not hearing you. Who is it? First of all, who's speaking? Okay. Okay. I'm so happy. Thank you so much for being part of this. And thank you so, so much for your comments. Um, 
Hi, Esther. I, I wish I knew everybody who was here. I'm trying to figure out how it works. Um, Vivian, do you have a list? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll take a picture for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and Eli has the document, and if anybody else wants it, you can um, email me, emilylabaton at gmail.com. So please, please, please stay healthy, stay home, take care of yourself primarily and your family and everybody else. Um, and Chag Sameach. And Chag Sameach. Happy Thank holiday, you. Emily. And I think we're going to have wonderful, Chag I think Sameach. we're going to have very meaningful Pesach. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you so much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you, Emily. Bye. I love seeing everybody. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Izzy. Thank you, Mrs. Labaton.